Hey teachers, and mom and dad, uncles, aunts, and grandparents. When working with students, the one thing we've learned over the years is the power of descriptive feedback. Students can learn without grades, but not without feedback. It really matters to student success and maturation. Teachers, and now parents who are home for extended periods of time doing teacherly things with the next generation of family. You may be looking for practical tips and techniques on providing critical feedback as they learn. And yeah, these ideas can be used with other household interactions as well. Because there's a lot here, and you might want to revisit the narration later, I'll post the text of this narration on my website, www.rickwarmly.com forward slash articles. There are two parts to this presentation, so be sure to watch part one and part two. Let's get started now with part one. Judgment and evaluation tend to invoke ego and self-preservation, not useful reflection and personal growth. Telling children that their work is poor, disorganized, and adding, did you even read the directions? Builds those defensive walls and increases anxiety. They can often pull back and sometimes They'll become overly reliant on the need for external validation before they try anything, which we don't want. We thought we were being helpful with these comments, but we were really pushing them away from investing in their own learning and really just venting frustration at them. In short, try to minimize anything that comes across as judgment or evaluation. We can still praise a child and share excitement about accomplishments. We're human and everyone needs a cheerleader from time to time. But judgment isn't really helpful when doing descriptive feedback. So, try not to telegraph your own opinion about students' work. The goal is for children themselves to see the errors and how to fix them, or their successes and the decisions that they made that led to that success. If we point these out to children ourselves, it makes them more passive in their learning, and they don't own it, and they disengage. To help, consider making comments about their decisions, not the quality of their work, as describing quality is a slippery slope into judgment. Judgments tend to be considered by recipients as high stakes and unchangeable, which can create moderate panic and grind learning to a halt. So, in the first years of my own teaching, I read a book that uh, by literacy expert Marjorie Frank called if you're going to teach writing, you got to have this book. And I was inspired by her comments that if we always mark up students' everyday punctuation and spelling errors in their writings, they will only use words they know how to spell and sentences they know how to punctuate. Well, they'll never venture further and never wrestle with ideas through writing. As a result, they don't grow as writers and thinkers, and we lose a major learning tool. It was the first moment I realized the inhibitive nature of judgment. That year, I transformed from one who judges everything students do, thinking it was good feedback, to one who helps students do the heavy lifting. Students do the majority of reflecting on their decisions and their outcomes, not me. Here are some examples of feedback that comment only on the decisions students made, not the quality of the work. Notice, too, that none of them telegraph opinion about the student's work. You included one piece of evidence for each claim. Notice here in the directions that you were asked to include two pieces or more of evidence per claim. What would you like to go back and change? You used all four suggestions for compelling introductions and as a reader it made me want to read the rest of your paper. Thank you for that. You split your notebook into a double entry journal placing notes on the left side, applications on the right. How did that work for you? You accounted for the amplitude of the wave. As a result, what can you now tell me about energy outputs that you couldn't tell me before? Hey, you cleared eight of the ten hurdles. What did you notice about the run and what would you like to try differently in the next one? Notice here that this is just raw data. No opinion of the run as good or bad for the students is offered. Hey, I noticed you used 500s for your vertical increments on the graph. Why did you not use 50s or 1000s? Notice here that we'd hoped students would comment on how using anything other than 500s would give a false interpretation of what actually happened in the situation. 
Notice that we use descriptive feedback even when what the students have done is correct. Half of descriptive feedback is explaining why things are correct, not just using it when things went awry. Here are a few examples from a student using the same idea. I use distilled water in the lab. As a result, I do not have as many contaminants potentially affecting my lab results. I arched my back on the dismount. Because I arched my back, I am able to make a fluid transition into the next element of the routine. Hey, I isolated the variable to one side of the equation sign. So I could plug in for x to get y and determine the coordinates to plot on my four quadrant graph. I tied my shoe using a new bow today and it didn't fall off. Hey, when I color with my crayon next to the ruler, it makes my picture a square. Basically, we're operating as a mirror here, reflecting back to students what they did, not judging it. As far as I know, outside of Snow White, mirrors don't judge us. This approach is similar to the point and describe strategy described by Jim Fay and David Funk in their popular book, Teaching with Love and Logic, Taking Control of the Classroom. Just as the, as the authors suggest doing when trying to teach students self-discipline, we can use the strategy to teach children to take charge of their academic learning. We help them make a connection between decisions made and the consequences, good or bad, of those decisions, a big step towards self-efficacy. To coach like this, consider memorizing and using five or six of the following starters for your feedback with children. Tell me more about what does that tell you? I hear you saying, X, is that what you intended to do? How does this match or differ from the example given? I noticed you, and a result, as a result, was that your goal? What do you mean by, can you give me an example of? What have you tried so far? Did this work? How do you know? If you were to do it again, what would you do differently? What have you tried in the past and was what was the result? I wonder what would happen if... How do you feel it went? How will you begin? What will you need for that? Imagine yourself at that point in the project. What will be going through your mind? What would you like me to look for as I watch or read this? Will that get you the accurate information you need? Why or why not? Useful feedback really works well when students can self-monitor their progress toward a goal. This means they can tell us what they're supposed to be learning and where they are in relation to that learning at any given point in the journey. So ask them, what are you supposed to be learning here? Or alternatively, what's the objective, standard, goal you're supposed to achieve? Second, where are you right now in relation to that goal? Author and educator Leanne Nicholson reminds us that setting clear, obtainable goals and monitoring our steps towards those goals are huge factors for motivation and cultivating perseverance. This is the end of Part 1. Part 2 offers multiple specific descriptive feedback techniques readily applicable to most classroom subjects for both teachers and parents to use right away. Be sure to watch it as well.